was Kathleen. Are we having a problem with the audio or are we okay? Okay, we're okay. Uh, you know what? We're going to talk about, I'm going to stay on this issue of Israel-Palestine until this bombardment, this siege on Gaza stops. Uh, yesterday, and no, actually today, uh, Israel uh, shelled, shot, shot fire, rocket fires into a UN school, killing children who were actually asleep. I mean, the world should be in disgrace, should feel shame. And yet most Americans have no idea, have no idea what's going on. The mainstream media and the politicians in the West, both sides, Democrats and Republicans, they don't inform the American people as to what is taking place. In fact, they feed the American people a steady diet of propaganda. That's what the American people are getting. And you would think after realizing there were no WMDs in Iraq, you would think after realizing that there were no WMDs in Iraq, you would think Americans would say, hey, wait, maybe we should be getting our information from somewhere else. Maybe we can't rely on our politicians when it comes to issues of foreign policy in the Middle East, when it comes to issues about going to war or not are funding a war, maybe we should get our information from somewhere else. Yet, you find that most Americans continue to rely on what their politicians tell them. And they rely on what their politicians tell them, depending on if they're Democrat or Republican, or conservative or liberal. If you're conservative, you believe what the Republicans say. You believe the narrative of the Republicans or the conservatives. If you're liberal or Democrat, you believe the narrative of the Democrats. You believe the narrative of the liberals. And on this issue of Israel and Palestine, both parties, both Democrats and Republicans, both parties side with Israel. Today, my guest is an Israeli author and peace activist, Miko Pelet, and he's going to set the record straight. He's going to inform KCA listeners. He's going to inform listeners to the Kathleen Wells Show what the real story is. Some, you know, I was talking to someone on Twitter and they were just like, you know, well, you know, Hamas is a terrorist organization. So I'm going to ask my guest, Miko, who I've had on before, and he was also on my show, Palestine Today, does he consider Hamas to be a terrorist organization? Miko is the author of the book, The General Son. I recommend it very highly. I read it. It brought tears to my eyes. It, and it also awakened me to things that I did not know, things that I do not hear from our politicians in the West, from our mainstream media, from our talking heads. I was listening to talk radio the other day. I think it was KFI. And they just say, well, what is Israel supposed to do? Hamas is the terrorist organization. Hamas is shelling, sending rockets into Israel, and Israel is concerned about her security. So what is, so what is, what is Israel supposed to do? That's the narrative that the mainstream media spins and the politicians. It's all about Israel's security. Well, as I said, my guest is Miko Pelet. He's an Israeli author and peace activist. Miko, are you with me? Yes, I'm right here. Well, the first question I want to ask you is, would you characterize Hamas as a terrorist organization? Well, (laughs) no, but uh, I think um, I think the question you asked before is even a better question, which is what is Israel supposed to do? And the two things relate, of course. Um, You know, Hamas is is a is a resistance organization. Hamas was created as a as in response to decades of, of brutal oppression and killing and um, by Israel of the Palestinians, and it reached a point where people could no longer sit still, and they felt they had to, uh, you know, they had to create this this organization as a resistance organization. It's the Islamic resistance organization, uh, and what is Israel to do? I think is is actually quite simple, because if Israel wants to end the activity of the Hamas or all the other or any other resistance organization, Hamas is not the only one, then what you do is you end the oppression. You end the oppression, you lift the siege on Gaza, you allow the people in Gaza, most of the vast majority of whom 
uh, refugees from other parts of Palestine, which became Israel, but really it was, a, it was Palestine, allow them to go back to their homes, allow them to go back to their land, pay restitution, and then there's no more reason, and release the political prisoners, thousands of political, Palestinians political prisoners in Israeli jails, and there will be no resistance. So if Israel really wants to end Hamas activities, Israel knows very well what to do. It's just that they don't want to do it. They don't want to do any of those things. They want to continue the oppression against the Palestinians. They want to continue occupying Palestinian land. They want to continue killing Palestinians. They want to continue holding Palestinian activists and politicians in Israeli jails, calling them terrorists. So they're going to have a resistance. This is how the world works. But it's very simple. If Israel wants to do something to change this, they could do it tomorrow morning. They could do it tomorrow morning. You know, I was on Twitter and I was tweeting with, is that how you say it? I don't know, with uh, Tom Holleran, who, and I know he's not listening. I asked, I asked him to listen to the show today and he said, no, I don't want to hear it, you know. But anyway, he was tweeting, he tweeted that your dad, he says, well, yeah, I know Miko Pellet. His dad, Maddie, is like one of these leftists. Would you, is that an accurate characterization of your father? Well, my dad was a, was a general, and uh, to call him a leftist, I think, is a bit of a stretch. But he, in Israel, in Israeli politics, you're either – you're a leftist if you talk about compromise, if you talk about peace, if you talk about Palestinian rights, you're a leftist. It doesn't matter if you believe in capitalism or not, if you believe in socialism or not, if you believe in anything else. The only – the only measure by which the only the only uh, thing you're measured by is your stance on the issue of Palestine, uh, and on the issue of Palestine, he after he retired from the military, he dedicated the second half of his life to promoting the idea of recognizing the rights of Palestinians, or not just the idea, but promoting the rights of Palestinians and fighting for the rights of Palestinians, um, and that's that really would define the rest of his life, the second half of his life after he retired from the military. But in Israeli terms and in terms of the thinking of, of Israeli politics, that's considered left. So left, that's what they want to call it. It's, a, it's, it's quite re funny, really, to, to, talk in, uh, to talk about it in those terms because it also creates – people also say, like, about me, they say, oh, he's a radical. He's an extremist. And I was in Central Europe. I was in Vienna, and I was thinking, here in Central Europe, are you telling me to talk about equal rights, to talk about human rights, to talk about civil rights is radical? Mm -hmm. This is radical. If, we, if we're at a point where we're talking about human rights and equal rights for people of all colors, of all religions, of all faiths, is radical, what has happened to the world? Since when is this radical? This is mainstream, middle of the road as you can get. Yeah, I but find that, that all, these. It all depends on the perspective. It all depends on perspective. Yeah, I find that these lab, assigning labels to groups to people is uh, lazy thinking. It's a shorthand way to say, well, you know, I'm not a critical thinker. I, don't, I can't, you know, I'm providing a superficial analysis of a situation by just assigning you a label. Oh, absolutely. Then you don't have to, there's no, you don't need, don't need a conversation anymore. You've got a label. It's much easier. Yeah. Well, you know what we're experiencing now? I mean, I've had you on my Wednesday show before you were on Palestine Today. We, we were, you were on when we were talking about Operation Pillar of Defense, which was taking place in late November 2012. Uh, in 2009, we had Operation Cast Lead. And now today they said this is the bloodiest offensive by Israel on Gaza. Uh, as of the latest statistics, more than 1,200 Palestinians. Palestinians have been killed. Give us the series of events. How did we get here with this latest offensive? Well, you, you can't take any of these any of these uh, attacks on Gaza as as uh, as though they were not connected to each other. They're connected to the larger picture. They're not isolated incidents. Israel began attacking the Gaza Strip in the early 1950s when the Gaza Strip was created. The Gaza Strip was created because of all the thousands and thousands of refugees who were thrown out of their home and their land in the southern part of Palestine mostly. And they put them together in camps around the city of Gaza and then created a line and said, okay, this is now the, called the Gaza Strip. And so, and as soon as that was created, it was created in the early 50s, a few years after the State of Israel was established, Israel began sending commandos and, 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 and army units and whatnot into Gaza to fight and kill the people in Gaza, these refugees. Now, these refugees wanted to go home. They would try to go back in. Now, they were not allowed to return. The border was, was, was created. 
Palestine was now Israel, and these people were, were, were stuck there in refugee camps. So sometimes they try to go home, sometimes they try to go to their land, sometimes they try to go get food, sometimes they would try as part of the armed resistance, and they would uh, you know, commit acts of armed resistance and so on. And Israel, at, right at that time, began attacking Gaza, and it hasn't stopped until today. The only thing that's changed between over the last 60, 65 years is the technology, and Israel's technology is much better, the army is much better equipped, so they're able to kill more people more effectively. But it's not any different from what they start, what they did in the early 50s. Now, in Cast Lead, which was, which was of, of, of the last horrendous attacks on Gaza, the largest uh, so far, they were limited in time because you may recall the 20th of January 2009 was Barack Obama's first inauguration, and they had to stop by then. So that's why they stopped, and the number of the casualty count ended at about 1,400 or 1,500 people. There are no limitations today. Israel is going to continue and attack and kill and attack and kill as long as it is allowed to do. I think they will go way past 2,000 uh, casualties. In other words, we've maybe, maybe seen half of it, but probably not even half of it. Israel can probably sustain 100, 150 casualties of soldiers itself. Um, in terms of the politicians, that's a small price to pay. And this horrendous, horrendous reality that the people in Gaza live with will not end until somebody steps in and forces Israel to stop. Um, and, you know, they, th this, is, this is the reality, and we have to see it in context. We have to see it in context. The only way this is going to be solved is when the refugees in Gaza, the people in Gaza, will be allowed to return to their homes, will be allowed, will be compensated, paid restitution when Israel is forced to rebuild this catastrophe that they've created in Gaza now. Mm -hmm. And you say the only time with this late, latest offensive that Israel will stop will, will be when someone is, who steps in and forces them to stop. We're going to take a break. My guest, we are speaking with my guest, Miko Pellet, Israeli author and peace activist. Miko Pellet, his book is The General Son. You got to read it. I read it. It brought tears to my eyes and it awakened me to the fact as to what is actually taking place as opposed to the propaganda we are constantly fed in the mainstream media. So uh, we're going to. Oh, and you know what? How would you feel about taking phone calls, Miko? Sure, no problem. Okay, so I'm going to give out the phone number. If there are any listeners out there that would like to comment or have a question for Miko, please feel free to call the toll-free number, which is 888 909 We'll be back with Miko. We'll, we're taking a break. We'll be right back. Thanks. Ah, welcome back, welcome back. This is the Kathleen Wells Show. I'm your host, Kathleen. My guest is Israeli peace activist and author, of the book, The General Son, Miko Pellet. And we were just talking about the fact that, well, I asked him initially the question, is Hamas a terrorist organization? Because someone tweeted me, in fact, I'm going to say his name, Tom Halloran, I know you're not listening, Tom, I wish you were, said that, said that Hamas is a terrorist organization. In fact, many talking heads in the media characterize Hamas as a terrorist organization. In fact, the U.S. State Department has characterized Hamas as a terrorist organization. Miko, at the break, we were talking about a paper that was written by a scholar. You want to talk about that? Yes. A, a friend of mine from, um, uh, from Gaza, Yusuf al-Jamal, who is now in Malaysia studying, uh, wrote an excellent paper called Hamas, a Terrorist Organization or Liberation Movement. Um, I just emailed it to you. And it's, it's, it's an excellent paper. It's, it's, it's very scholarly. Uh, Yusuf is from Gaza. His family is there uh, right now. Um, he's from uh, the Nusrat uh, refugee camp. Um, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he tackles this question, what is Hamas? Is it really a terrorist organization or is it a, a liberation movement? And I think if we, we, we have to see Hamas in context. We have to see every aspect of the Israeli-Palestinian issue in context with the larger picture, which is a, a six-and-a-half-decade-long um, story of, of oppression and dispossession and a brutal, brutal attack by Israel, who's the stronger force here, against the Palestinians. Um, you know, Yusuf, is a, he, he's, a, he's on Twitter, he's on Facebook, he's a great writer, he's a great speaker. He's a young man. I strongly recommend uh, that you have him on the show. He and I traveled and spoke together. And... Um, and I think it's important to, to snap out of this of this um, um, this idea that we label something, like you said earlier, this labeling of something, and then the conversation ends. Oh, they're terrorists. What does that exactly mean? Mm -hmm. The State Department follows the guidelines that are set by Israel, 
which is why eventually Hamas was, was, was recognized as a terrorist organization and Islamic charities in America were closed. The Holy Land Foundation, five men who dedicated their lives to charity are, are now in prison because of this and, and so forth. I mean, th- there's this lunacy over the word terrorism and nobody sits to, well, not enough people, I should say. Some people do. You know, sit, sit for a moment and read. Uh, what, what is it exactly that we're talking about? What is terrorism? There's another great scholar, Palestinian scholar, Azam Tamimi, who's written an excellent book about Hamas. It's called The uh, Unwritten Chapters. Um, you know, people, should, if, if you're interested, if people really know, want to know about this, uh, you know, open a book. Uh, see what Palestinians are saying. Read from the people who really live there and really experience it and are really a part of it and see it in context. What it was that brought about uh, this, um, this, this, this reaction, what it is that brought about this resistance. And then you get a good understanding of what, what, of what is going on. And what's interesting is that even Israelis, I mean, I, I just came back. I was there now for six, week in, in Pal- six weeks in Palestine. I, most, you know, I stay in Jerusalem when I'm there. It's a 45-minute drive to Gaza. And you'd think that Gaza was on the moon, the way Israelis, how little they know about what is going on there and how little they care about what is going on there as though it's somebody else's problem. Uh, but you'd hope that at least here in the U.S., since so much money is poured into Israel from the U.S. and so much, so many weapons are sent, and U.S. is complicit and is, is certainly seen as complicit with Israeli crimes towards the Palestinians, at least Americans would know what this money is being used and against who it's being. These weapons are being used. Okay, you know, and what I like to say is that propaganda works to make one man's terrorist another man's freedom fighter. In fact, Nelson Mandela was on the U.S. State Department terrorist list. Uh, Martin Luther King was characterized as a terrorist. Uh, Many believe that the KKK is a—I mean, you know, wasn't Ariel Sharon considered a terrorist? He bombed a King David Hotel. It wasn't Ariel Sharon, it was Tzachak Shamir, another prime minister, but I think they were terrorists. I think in their case it's true. You see, so these concepts are uh, relative concepts, and you've got to dig deeper to find out what's really going on. Absolutely. I mean, you know, if people are, you know, basically if you're fighting for your freedom, if you're being oppressed, if you're fighting against the establishment for the freedom and self-actualization of your own group, that's sort of like fighting the establishment sort of makes you a sort of a terrorist, I think. Because Nelson Mandela was a terrorist, right? Of course, and many people in the U.S., it wasn't until, what, the late, uh, late 1980s that people started looking at Nelson Mandela and uh, the whole uh, the, 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 the anti-apartheid movement that the established began to support them. I mean, it was a long, tough struggle for the anti-apartheid movement in the U.S. to get, uh, I mean, even as late as, as the Reagan administration, they refused to boycott South Africa. But of course, today when you talk to people, everybody loved Nelson Mandela. Everybody, everybody adored Nelson Mandela. Everybody talks about Nelson Mandela like he was the Messiah. <laughs> but there are people who, 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 who acted, who acted directly in order to keep him in prison. And if they had their way, people like Reagan and others, he would have died in prison. So I think it's important to put this again in perspective. And you're right; people do people do label somebody a terrorist, and that's it. And if you're fighting for a cause, you know, there was an interview with my dad years and years ago. And he was asked, as, as a retired general, how could you possibly advocate how – could, how could you possibly advocate that Israel deal with terrorists? And this is before Hamas. They were talking about the PLO because uh, all Palestinians are considered terrorists by Israel. By Israel. Um, and he said, well, terrorism, of course, is a terrible thing. But when a small nation is occupied and oppressed by a larger power, quite often they're, they're, this is the only means at their disposal. Nobody's listening. Nobody's paying attention. Nobody cares. I mean, the rockets coming out of the uh, out of Gaza um, hurt no one. I mean, they 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 fly out of there. They're not guided missiles or anything like this. This is a very primitive uh, weapon, and they and they you know they, they haven't hurt anyone, so they're very ineffective in terms of weapons. Okay, but to expect that people in Gaza would live all of these years under such oppression, you know, where. F- in Gaza, a, a mother who needs antibiotics for her child, you know, if he has an ear infection, can't find it because of the siege imposed by Israel, the U.S., and, and Egypt. But 10 minutes away from there in an Israeli city, you wouldn't dream of not having antibiotics. You wouldn't dream of not being able to go to a pharmacy and buy basic medicine or having clean water or being free to wander around and travel and get in your car and go places 10 minutes away. So to expect that people who live like this will not react with violence, will not react with some kind of an armed resistance, is absolutely stupid. 
that's impossible. I think what's surprising about the Palestinian resistance in general, if we look at a six or seven decade span, is just how little of it is actually armed and how most of it has been unarmed resistance. Okay, we're going to take a call now from Mandy. Hi, Mandy. You have a call for Miko. You have a question, rather, for Miko. Hi, I do. Um, thanks for taking the call. And uh, Mr. Pavet, I so admire and appreciate what you're doing. And um, I was going to ask you whether you're in more demand now and have finding a more receptive audience in the last couple of years. But that's kind of a trivial question. And while I was waiting, another question occurred to me, and that is. Jamon Perez, um, is he an honest broker, and can he help make a difference in this situation? Shimon Perez? Yes. Yeah, no, no way. Shimon Perez is probably is probably one of the biggest in terms of in terms of uh, Israeli crimes against the Palestinians. He's probably one of the one of the biggest hypocrites and the biggest liars. Uh, he had so many chances to ch- bring about change, and he didn't. He was in power. He's been in politics his whole life. He's 80-something years old now, close to 90 right. years old. Uh, he was the one who brought in nuclear weapons to Israel and, and began the Israel, the Israel's uh, nuclear weapons program, which is, of course, a catastrophe um, and, and, and unjustifiable in any by any means. So, no, Shimon Perez is not an honest broker. He's not honest at all, and he's certainly not a... A broker, and he's certainly not interested in peace. I, I, there's nobody in, in, in the Israeli political spectrum, in the Zionist political spectrum, that we could look at as an honest broker. Because by accepting the state of Israel and by accepting Zionist ideology, they are racists. And it's like right. expecting somebody from uh, apartheid South Africa to be a, an honest broker when it comes to ending apartheid. It's a, it's a, it's not something that the, the, these are opposites, complete opposites. And there's there's no no reason to expect that would change. In terms of my demand, you know, I think over the last, what I've seen over the last few years is that the willingness in America to hear a anti Zionist perspective, which is what I present, has grown considerably. Um, you know, it was, uh, when was it that uh, Jimmy Carter came out with his book and he said the word apartheid uh, yeah. about Palestine and p- people wouldn't let him on campuses? Today, You've got people like myself, there's Ilan Pape, there's, uh, there's Max Blumenthal, there's a whole host of, of speakers, uh, many of whom are Jewish, actually, interestingly enough, who present an anti-Zionist, clear anti-Zionist perspective. And there's uh, not enough of us to go around because people are hungry to hear this. I think it's in many ways, this is validating what people have been thinking for a very long time, that Israel is a racist state, that Zionism is a racist ideology, it's a colonialist ideology that has to be brought to an end and replaced with a real democracy. So yes, there's definitely a lot more willingness um, to hear this perspective, and, 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 I, and I see this uh, absolutely all the time. Yeah, that was my sense. Now, that's interesting about Perez, because he sounds so reasonable and so compassionate. I heard him on Charlie Rose a couple weeks ago, and I was impressed, but apparently... That's not the case. No, no. He neither he or anybody else in Israeli politics is sincere on this issue. Look, he 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 received the Nobel Prize for what? For being one of the architects of the Oslo Accords that were signed in 1993, and kind of many people thought were the first step into a real peace agreement between Israel and Palestine. Until people actually noticed what the Oslo Accords were doing. And today, people realize the Oslo Accords were an attempt to destroy the Palestinians socially, to destroy them economically, and to destroy them politically. And that's exactly what Oslo did. The situation now for Palestinians after Oslo is is much, much worse than it ever was before. And that was the purpose of Oslo. You know, so people today say, oh, you know, the peace process is failing. The Oslo process is failing. The Oslo process has been a tremendous success an unprecedented success, and it's done exactly what it was supposed to do, which was, which is to make life more difficult for Palestinians and to strengthen Israeli hold on the land, on the resources, on the economy, and on the people. And that's what this so-called peace process was supposed to bring about, and he is one of the architects. His desire and the desire of, of other Israeli politicians is to destroy Palestine, to destroy the Palestinians, to make them either die or completely surrender. Right. Those are the options. But your YouTube um, book readings are 
uh, everyone should hear them. They're fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, and I really appreciate learning so much from you. Thank you. Okay, thank Thanks you, Mandy. We have another call. Bye-bye. But before we take the other call, I want to ask you, you know, about the Oslo Accords. Arafat agreed to that. So what is your position about – what do you think about Arafat? What do you think about him? Yasser Arafat was the most consistent voice for peace for 30 years. From the mid-1970s, he accepted this idea that the Palestinians should make peace with Israel based on what is now called the two-state solution. And people like my father and other Israelis who, like you said in the earlier, they call them leftists, uh, were a big part of working with Arafat and with his close uh, kind of close circle of people to convince them that this was a possibility, that they could make peace with Israel based on this idea that the Palestinians would give up 80% of Palestine and receive the 20%, which is the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, with East Jerusalem as their capital, and there would be a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. Now, Yasser Arafat accepted this unofficially in the mid-1970s, in the late 80s, it was a little more formal, but he basically accepted it, and, and, and talks began in that, during those days, you know, like I said, the mid-70s, to bring about and to, and, to, and to explore this possibility. Israel wanted nothing to do with it. Now, uh, he continued, he continued to promote this idea and believe in this idea until the day he died, which was 2004, the end of 2004, and he continued uh, persistently to and consistently to talk about this idea of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Israel did everything it possibly could to make that an impossibility. They built settlements, they destroyed Palestinian uh, economy, they destroyed Palestinian uh, homes and so forth. Now, in the beginning, there was a lot of hope. People really thought that maybe something had changed. You know, by by, their, by 1993, the Soviet Union had fallen. Apartheid in South Africa had fallen. Nelson Mandela was about to become president. There was a sense of unity. There was a sense of hope. There was a sense that the world was changing. And there was a serious sense that Palestine is next and that Israel has really changed. People like Perez and Yitzhak Rabin and those, these guys really changed and were really interested in peace. What was discovered by some people, it was really quick. I mean, my father talked about it quite 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 soon. Uh, other Palestinians, Edward Said and others, talked about it quite soon. They realized because they read the accords and they saw that it was a surrender. It wasn't a, it wasn't a peace accord. Um, and eventually, Arafat realized it as well. But of course, it was it was too late. And he thoroughly believed in the process, and he thoroughly believed that this process would lead to a Palestinian state, that it would be good for the Palestinians. Um, sadly, he was wrong, and 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 the Israelis uh, succeeded in in. In many ways, but in many ways they didn't succeed too because, of course, the Palestinian resistance did not stop and uh, the Palestinians are still there fighting and the Palestinians will not surrender. Um, so so Israel is still strong and Israel is still you know, in control and is still doing as much harm as they can to the Palestinians. But Palestinians, as we can see obviously now, particularly now, absolutely refuse to surrender. Palestinians refuse to re- surrender. Israel is backed by the United States. We're going to take a call now from Gary. Hi, Gary. Uh, hello. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, point of view because uh, without your show, I never would have uh, seen the other side. But my uh, question or my comment to you and your guest is, what do you uh, think of the impact of uh, the televangelists on TV that are so pro-Israel you know, like on Daystar and TBN and preachers like uh, John Hagee, do they have any power? Do they have very much influence on the situation? And um, I'll just take your comment off the air. Thank you very much. You want to go at that first, Miko? Sure. I think their impact is is is, um, is very dangerous. I think they are very dangerous people. I think their impact is, is uh, very negative. They give Israel enormous amounts of money. Uh, and uh, they don't. What's funny? What's absurd is that they don't realize the contempt with which Israel treats them and, and looks at them. The Israelis think that they're a bunch of, you know, messianic lunatics. But they're giving them a lot of money. They come on these visits to Israel and they visit um, um, army bases and they see how all these, all you know, the wonders of Israel, how wonderful and open and democratic and so forth Israel is. They completely ignore the fact 
that Israel destroyed Christian life in Palestine. Christians used to make up about 12% of the population. Today, the Christians merely, barely make up 2% of the population. Um, the Palestinians who are Christians suffer just as much as Palestinians who are Muslims. Israel doesn't make that distinction. And they care nothing, these evangelists, for the Christians in, in, in Palestine, which is, which is really quite ironic. Um, but there they are, and I think they are, like I said, I think they're both very dangerous, and I think they have an impact, which is a very, very uh, negative impact, because here in America, they've got so much money. And they, for somehow, they've got this messianic idea that supporting Israel is the right thing religiously and so forth. They're considered Christian Zionists. And in fact, I've interviewed a peace activist, Israeli peace activist, Yuri Avnery. He says the Christian Zionists just are just as dangerous as the Jewish Zionists. And that's something that the guy that I was tweeting, Tom Halloran, he's a Christian Zionist. He just hates all Muslims, but he has no, he thinks Muslims are terrorists, but he has no idea. He doesn't know that they're Christian Palestinians. He has, he doesn't even realize this fact. Okay, we're going to take another call from Angel Gonzalez. Hi, Angel. You have a question for Miko? Yes. Um, not sure quite how to word it, but um, in one of your YouTube presentations, you compare um, the Israeli state, well, the situation to apartheid South Africa, to the civil rights movement in the South. Um, and you also say that you think that the Israeli state can become a democracy very quickly, rather quickly. The thing that I that I find hard to see is that happening with U.S. support so heavily pro-Israel. Um, and the reason I say that is because in the civil rights situation of, in the South, the federal government had to send in the National Guard to get the situation going. And, of course, they supported boycotts of the party of South Africa until the regime fell. How is it that you see that there will truly be a democracy so quickly or relatively quickly in Israel? Excellent question. Um, an excellent point to bring up. You know, they brought in the National Guard after years and years and years of very hard work by African-American activists and, and leaders to force the federal government to end to end uh, legalized racism and apartheid in, in the South. So in other words, the federal government wasn't there to begin with. At some point, they were forced to accept it. And after they were forced to accept it, that became the law of the land. Same thing with South Africa. It was uh, Ronald Reagan refused to impose boycott on, on South Africa. We're talking about the mid-'80s now. And by 1994, Nelson Mandela was already president. So these things change as a result of a lot of work. Um, America, the, the United States eventually supported an, uh, the, the boycott and sanctions against apartheid South Africa, but only as a result of massive, massive pressure, both international and, and domestic, to force American politicians. And I know many um, people who were, were veterans of that, of that era who worked very hard with the anti-apartheid movement here in the United States, and now they are... Uh, supporting the Palestinian cause, and they see many, many similarities in how hard it was to get American politicians to break away from their support of apartheid in South Africa. Um, and again, it, they succeeded, and eventually uh, South Africa and apartheid fell, and Jim Crow in the South fell. But it wasn't there to begin with. It was the result of, 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 of real pressure. Now, if we look a little bit f further back in history, not that far, but just a little bit further back, um, you know, in the early 1970s, there were still pres American president. There was still an American president who swore that the United States would never forsake its most important ally in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think kids in school today don't even know that there was such a country called South Vietnam. That was that. That was that most important ally that an American president swore. America would not for, would not forsake, and two three years later, it was no longer it, it no longer existed. So, American support for evil regimes in in in, in South Af in South Africa, American support for for dictatorships in Latin America, you know, is something that we have to fight. And now, American support for for the state of Israel. These are all things that 
uh, this is part of the struggle, you know, changing that. But America has a history. The United States has a history of supporting evil regimes all around the world. And when Americans decide to speak, these things change. And that's exactly what happened in the two cases you brought up in the South with Jim Crow and then in the apartheid South Africa. It only came as a result of pressure, domestic pressure, where, where politicians realized they had no choice and it's time for the U.S. to change direction. And I thoroughly believe that uh, we, we can see the first signs of that here now in the U.S., Okay, Angel, thank you for the call. You know, you have, we you. Have a, we've got a lot of phone calls. You know what? Every time one of these offensive, Israeli offensives against the Palestinian people takes place, the lines just lit, light up. Because you know why? Because the American people are fed a constant diet of propaganda. And we're so hungry for the truth. Some of us, not all of us. Many of us, I should say. And that's why, you know, the phones have lit up because they want to talk to you, Miko, because people, Americans are frustrated with the lies and the propaganda. They've had enough. I mean, there's still, you know, most Americans are still brain dead, but there's some of us that have awakened to the truth or we're at least curious and we want to know what's going on. So now we're going to take a call from Ray. He has a question. Hi, Ray. Hi, Ray. Hi. Hi, you have a question for me, Nico? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, actually, my name is Nitin. I, I don't think your uh, your staff person got my name right. I think Nico knows me. We, we just recently exchanged emails, and I'm, I'm actually in South Africa. It's my first day here, and I'm uh, I'm just blown away with my experience here. And I can't tell that something like Apostolic existed here 30 years ago. And so I'm mean, I'm with Nico on on his uh, sort of quest to change Israel. And my question for him is, um, what what kind of support do you have within Israel of the citizens of Israel uh, in, in this anti so sort of this, this anti-Zionist uh, uh, stance that you have? You know, what, what kind of support do you have there? Um, so you're calling from South Africa now? Yes, I'm visiting South Africa uh, on the vacation. I was there in um, March. It's, it's, really a, it's an ironic, amazing place. Here. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thanks for calling from South Africa. Listen, um, the support for, for an anti-Zionist um, perspective in Israel, if you can imagine the support in the southern states of the United States in the 60s to end Jim Crow or among whites, you know, the support among whites mm-hmm. in, in the southern states to end the legalized racism and apartheid that existed here, or if you compare it to, you know, how whites in South Africa felt about ending apartheid, you know, I think they'd give you a good idea of how Israelis feel. Israelis are privileged, and privileged people never give up their privilege willingly. Um, and they create all these myths about terrorism and how the others will come and slaughter them and rape their women and all of this nonsense uh, in order to maintain their privilege. And Israelis are doing the exact same thing. But people who are like that, people who are in these situations, they change the day after. In other words, they wake up one morning, Israelis are going to wake up one morning, and they're going to realize that the world has changed, that uh, there are going to be elections and everybody will get to participate equally, that they may well have a Palestinian prime minister, you know, like the whites in South Africa woke up one day and they knew Nelson Mandela was going to be president. So people like that only change the day after where they realize the sky is not going to fall. The change has come, and it's actually better for everyone. So I, I expect that is going to happen in Israel um, in Israel as well. You know, Kathleen, you mentioned the word offensive. I think we should call it a massacre, which is really what it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is, is. What Israel is doing in, in Gaza is not an offensive. It's a massacre. Okay. I, where did I get that word? I think I heard that on RT. They said it's Israeli offensive. I listen to RT. Do you do you watch that? Program? They interview me all the time. I, you know, there are some great shows on RT, of course. But uh, I think calling it offensive is 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 taking offensive. Take, taking a massacre and 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 washing it washing it really really well to try to make it all squeaky clean. Right, right. I agree with you. Uh, like I said at the beginning, the world should hang its head in shame. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What is your name again from South Africa? It's uh, it's Mitten. Mitten. Yes, I'm. I'm actually American. I'm. I'm Indi- I'm American of Indian descent. So you know, I really relate to what Nico has been saying. And you know, India experienced many years ago a partition, 
and um, and there's hell going on in Pakistan right now because you know it, it was built on the premise of religion, and, uh, and we know what's going on there. And whereas India, being you know, despite itself being a democratic, you know, its democ- democratic principles have sort of led India to be you know where it is today. And I just totally see that. Uh, you know, I hope that Israel um, would be that country one day. Uh, where it's yeah, Israel, all the, the situation in Israel is a lot simpler. It's a lot more simple. I think there's a big, greater chance of success there than there ever was in yeah. South Africa or in India or any other play, any other multinational uh, state right. that, is, that is ridding itself of, of, of uh, a non-democratic regime because it's very small. The post populations are highly educated. You don't have you know millions of uneducated, impoverished people. Both both sides are high. even in Gaza. Education levels, you know, literacy rates are highest in the world, over ninety two percent. I mean, so you have you have two societies that are that are productive and ready to go to work tomorrow morning, and are actually very similar societies. If we take out the conflict and we just compare the two societies, they're actually very very similar. So the chance of success there, I think, are tremendous. Well, I love your optimism, Miko, but uh, we have Palestinian children being killed in their sleep, and that doesn't make me feel very optimistic. So thank you, Mitten, for your call. And now we're going to take a question from Doug. Hi, Doug. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. You have a question for Miko? Yeah, I, I don't understand. I, I, I keep seeing um, free Palestine, free Palestine on all the protest banners and all over the world. But my, my understanding was that there was never a country named Palestine, and that Palestine was really the area of the Palestinian mandate, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, I think Iraq also, and the land now called Israel. That was all Palestine. So when they say free Palestine, do they, do they mean just free Israel, or do they mean free the entire Palestinian mandate? Do they, do they mean, I mean, what does that actually mean, free Palestine? Does it only refer to Israel? Good question. You know, if you look at maps of the region pre-1948, you're going to see a very specific area called Palestine. It's very clear, right. it's very specific. It doesn't include Iraq, it doesn't include Syria, it includes Palestine. You're right that originally it included both sides of the Jordan River, and then the British during the mandate split it and said, okay, well, Palestine is only going to be west of the Jordan River. Um, and they created the Jordan, which is kind of a new thing. But Palestine has been there. If you look at maps, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, uh, to, to Thomas Jefferson's house in, uh, you know, in, in, in Virginia, uh, Monticello, uh, Monticello, right? Monticello, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you walk into the foyer, there's a big map that his father drew. His father was a map maker, and it's a map of Africa. And if you look north and east of Africa, you're going to see exactly Palestine, and that's exactly where Palestine is. When we say free Palestine, we're talking about freeing Palestine, which is within the boundaries of what the state of Israel is today. Um, which is an Arab country. It's been an Arab country and a Muslim country for, for over a thousand years. And it was taken over by a racist colonialist regime, which is what Israel wait, is, wait, was created, the, 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 regi- the, the, the ideology that created Israel. Whoa, whoa, uh, and we're up. talking about freeing Palestine back from up. that regime and freeing the entire country yeah, yeah, and allowing yeah. Palestinians to return to their right. homes, all the th- millions of yeah. refugees who were forced out and their, mm-hmm. and their, and their children, the descendants, of course, over the last uh, six and a half decades. Okay, so it's very specific. It's very, very clear what, yeah. what is being said. Very clear. It means, destroying, it's, too. it means destroying Israel. But when you say it was an Arab country for a thousand years, that's a total lie. It yeah. never was an Arab country there, ever. Where did and it, it belonged, didn't it belong to the Ottoman Turks last we knew, before World War One. I? I mean... What Arab country are you talking about that was, that was located in the boundaries of Israel? Well, what did, was the name of this country? Palestine. Didn't your father, in your book, Miko, you wrote that your father had a Palestinian yeah, passport. My, my father, my, both, both my parents, uh, their, their first passports and their, and their birth certificates say born, born in Palestine. But this is, this is part of this demagoguery that says, oh, you know, if you talk about 
if you talk about transforming this this very racist and brutal regime, which is what Zionism is and what Israel is, into a democracy, then you're talking about destroying Israel and everybody shivers and hides under the table because they imagine another Holocaust, which is part of this propaganda, you know, anti, you know, the pro-Israeli propaganda. It's complete nonsense. Nobody's talking about destroying anything. We're talking about 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 the transformation from a brutal, racist, colonialist, non-democratic entity, which is what Israel is, yeah. back yeah, into or, or into over and over. democracy. Uh, a real democracy, which now inevitably includes Israelis, because Israelis, like the whites in South Africa, even though we are the children of, of, of colonizers and settlers, yeah, we know, we're now there. Okay, let, well, you know and what? Creating we got a democracy two minutes. and, and, and this, over this over notion over that yeah. Palestine was not an Arab country, you know, is 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 just so. It's it's either propaganda or it's ignorance. I don't know which which angle you come from. If you're just ignorant. Or you're, or you're or you're spewing he, nonsense uh, because spewing this nonsense. is somebody gave you a note with this nonsense. Right, he's spewing nonsense. To say nonsense. that it was not an Arab country is absurd. It's absurd. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So let's take a lot. We have one more minute. Let's take our last call from Elizabeth. L- Elizabeth, can you get your question in? in yes. In one minute. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Uh, this is Elizabeth from Front Royal. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Pallad, for your um, your integrity. And uh, actually, your and your vast knowledge, which uh, and um, uh, one of the questions I want to ask you is: uh, Are you aware, as, as you must be, that Palestine they had coins, they had uh, uh, everything uh, emblematic of of a functioning society. They had thriving cities, and they were they were Palestinian, and actually, it was. Uh, more than a thousand years, and that uh, when the Muslims controlled, it, they were simply um, colonized by others. But they were still, they were still Palestine. Nothing changed that. And so, when one lives in an area, one is, if you live in Palestine, as, as which has existed for centuries. Obviously, you're a Palestinian. But at, at any rate, I'm sorry. Would you discuss the economy and the <laughs> thriving towns that existed? Well, I don't know if we have yeah. enough time. We've got to have Miko back. How much time do we have, Carlos? We have 30 seconds. I want to I wanna have Miko back. We don't have time to... Uh-huh. I love your question, though. We're going to have Miko back, and you can call in again, Elizabeth. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm lo- sorry. Yeah, I'm going to... You know, Miko, we're going to have you back. My guest is Israeli peace activist and author of The General Son, Miko Palet. We're going to have him back. I love you as a guest, Miko, and we'll have you back soon, okay? Love you, too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth. This is the Kathleen Wells Show. Next week, we're going to have Jeff Blankford, and we're going to have Miko back very, very soon, I promise. Thanks. We'll see you next week.